I'm in. Are we okay? All right. Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Deva Maheshwar, Guru Sakshat Para Brahma, Tasme Sri Gureva Namaha. Ramanandam Paramasukadam Evalam Gyanamurti Tandvati Taham Vaganasadrishaham Tattvamashadi Laksham Ekam Nityam Vimalamachalam Sarvade Sakshibutam Bahuati Taham Triguna Rahitaham Satgurum Tvam Namaham Full of bliss Giving joy transcendent Of higher knowledge The abode Do all no more Clear as the heaven Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashai, Swami Sri Yukteswar, Beloved Guru, Aramahansa Yoganandaji, Saints and Sages of East and West, Sri Patanjali, we bow to you. Friend and guide Swami Kriyananda, continue to enlighten us through your wisdom and your presence, through the example of your life. Demystify our journey that we may enter the clear skies of liberation. Om. Peace. Amen. Let's meditate. Let's sit upright, chest up and shoulders down. Take a deep breath, inhale. Throw the breath out. This time, tensing the whole body, inhale. Vibrate with joy. Exhale. One more time, inhale, intense. Vibrate, exhale. Let go of the day's activities. Enter the door of the heart and rest content there. On the throne of intuition, with the masters by your side, surrounding us with their light and joy, beckoning us to come home. 
In the rested heart, then, lift the gaze upward to enlightenment through the precepts and truth teachings of Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, clarified by our line of gurus and by our teacher. Let's do a few breaths similar to last week. Twelve simple breaths of the four-part inhalation. Hold the breath, exhalation. Hold the breath out. Approximately seven up and down and four at top and bottom. As you inhale, as we did last week, feel the prana coming up the front of the body to the spiritual eye. And after holding the breath, three or four counts, when you exhale, Feel the breath descending to the medulla and then down the back like a, like a warm shower of grace. So let's try this. And at the top of each, I'll say the name of one of our preceptors as a focal point. Relax the diaphragm. Let's first do two breaths, practice breaths. Inhale up the front of the body through the nose. Use the throat sound if you like. Hold the breath gently at the top. Exhale down the back. Pause with the breath held out there at the bottom. Repeat, inhale up the front slowly. Hold the breath, concentrating your gaze with joy, the spiritual eye. Exhale down the back through the medulla. And let's begin. Inhale. Hold, Lord Jesus Christ. Exhale. Pausing at the bottom, three or four counts. Let the heart be quiet, inhale. Hold and focus, Mahavatar Babaji. Exhale down the back. Rest at the base of the shashumna. Inhale. Hold. Yogavatar Lahiri Mahashai. Exhale. Rest with Kundalini, inviting her to rise. Inhale. Hold Gyanavatar Swami Sri Yukteswar. Exhale. Rest in the self. Inhale. Hold. Premavatar. Maramahansa Yogananda. Exhale. Rest. Inhale. Hold Sri Ram J Ram J J Ram. Exhale. Inhale. Sri 
Sri Patanjali. Exhale. Inhale. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Exhale. Inhale. Hold. Adi Shankaracharya. Exhale. Inhale. Jai Rajasi Janakananda. Exhale. Inhale. Sister Gyanamata. Exhale. And finally, inhale. Swami Kriyananda. Exhale. Now we'll just sit in silence for a few minutes resting in the spine, worshiping in the spine, on the altar of the spine. Call to mind one of these masters where the blessings of peace, the own vibration, etc. Rest in the spine with the joy of spirit.
Let's affirm together. From joy I came. For joy I live. In sacred joy I knelt. From joy I came. For joy I live. In sacred joy I knelt. this affirmation back to joy itself at the spiritual eye, repeating, affirming mentally, from joy I came, for joy I live, in sacred joy I know. Feel that joy within and around and in blessing of one another. We start, I think, at, um, can you cue it up to 30, 35? So we had some very good um, things come in by email, questions, or whatever you want to call them, comments. And uh, I have most of them woven throughout my notes, so we'll see how that goes. Sometimes it's just easier to knock them off in the beginning and then I don't have to think so much, but it's nice to have them in context also. Um, however, Zach, are you here, Zach? Oh, he's watching on TV, is he? Rascal. He had the suggestion. He said he enjoys, as I hope you all do, the Sanskrit that uh, Morley does, but he said that when uh, the English first and Sanskrit, then meditation, he said he couldn't remember what the English was to meditate on it. So Morley and I talked it over and, and Morley agreed that he'd read the Sanskrit first, then the English, then we'd be silent, and then reread the English. Does that sound okay? Yeah. Okay, so let me just see where we are. Somebody say something? Yeah, slide 35. Stands a 35, not slide. I don't, yeah. Yeah, it's somewhere. Um, okay, let me just check my notes. Somebody actually asked, if, does a rock have a soul? And uh, no, it wasn't Steve, no. And uh, when I asked Swami that years ago in the car, he just gave me a dirty look. <laughs> you egg airhead. <laughs> he didn't actually say that, but <laughs> he looked disgusted. <laughs> anyway. Uh, Okay, I think we'll start with, with 35, okay? Are we good? Oh, there we are, good. So let's just sit up as if we are about to meditate, which we are. Uh, here's the Sanskrit for 35. Vishaya vativa pravritti rutpanna manasaha sthiti nibandhani. Otherwise, Concentration on subtle sense perceptions can bring about steadiness. Otherwise, 
concentration on subtle sense perceptions can bring about steadiness. Swami points out the, the uh, yogic teaching that it's not five senses that we have, but in a sense, ten. And uh, the five obvious outer senses, of course, and then the five inner senses, which is our capacity or power, our astral ability to hear, taste, and so forth through the outer senses, that pre-exists, which is why um, in meditation we can hear the things like the sounds of the chakras, even if a person is in fact deaf. And so um, it brings up the question though, well, before I go up, bring up the question, some of you may know from some of other uh, Yogananda's teachings and other lots of other sources in the general teachings of Shankya and Yoga, that the first five chakras are, uh, contain, if you will, the intelligence and the vibratory uh, aspects of the outer five senses. So, for example, the Mulidhar, the earth center of chakra, um, sort of has the contains or emits or gives to us the power of smell. Swadhisthan, the power of taste. Uh, Manipur, the power of sight. Um, the anahat, the power of touch, and the um, vishuddha. vishuddha, the power of hearing. But that's actually not what he's talking about here. Those are the powers as they relate to the five outer senses. For we in meditation, the yogi in meditation, for the most part, uh, perceives the astral senses not in the lower centers, but in the higher centers of cognition, you know. So, for example, we hear om and, and other chakra sounds here inside the right ear, not, you know, down here, even if they emanate from there. So there is that distinction. But although that's interesting trivia, it's not all that practical for us in our daily life. But what is practical for us and the kinds of questions that certainly I've asked myself in 40 years of meditation, and, and many of you have too, and part of the questions that came during the week have to do with the issue of um, what are we supposed to do when we finished our Kriya, let's say, and we're in the third phase of meditation and we're supposed to not be doing anything, but we're supposed to be being everything, so to speak. And uh, I think most of you know that Master counseled directly in his writings that in that third phase of meditation, even though ideally we're high, if you will, in super consciousness, um, on a practical level until we are, he said, you could cheat a little bit, practice bhakti yoga. Uh, I, I love the one especially where he says, worship on the altar of the spine. Partly I love it because when I throw it out, the new students, they look really puzzled. <laughs> First off, they're not into worshiping anything. And so the second part, they haven't found the spine yet. So it's, it's really kind of a trick uh, suggestion to make, or unfair suggestion to make. Um, but it, for we Kriya yogis especially, uh, that makes a lot of sense. To That's the river of baptism, Master tells us in his commentaries on, uh, on the Bible, for example. And so to rest in the spine is, is quite... Um, I was going to say charming, but it's actually quite beautiful and, and devotional. He also says, I think he says, you can practice um, Hong Sa on the spine, which essentially is the same thing. But uh, So then people say, well, wait a minute. You're not supposed to practice techniques in that phase. So what gives? It's very confusing. And this was, in fact, uh, the, the uh, frustration Swami felt as a young student and monk in uh, trying to understand how master taught, because first he'd say one thing, and then he'd say the, something that seemed like the opposite, and you had to figure it out. Um, all is fair in love and war and meditation, and so whatever keeps you there is basically fair, fair game. Obviously, uh, we want to be in super consciousness, and beginning a, getting a little more serious and focused here, Patanjali is basically saying the same thing. He's saying, in meditation, focus on, yearn for, be attentive to, and then focus upon any of the inner astral perceptions 
Now, meditators, students, often get confused. They think if they have some of these perceptions that they're maybe more spiritual than the person next to them, or if they don't, the opposite. Uh, Patanjali makes no such claim whatsoever. Uh, and Swami cautions us as well. After all, some people see the spiritual eye and they're not even on the spiritual path as we define it and know it at least. Um, I've had students tell me that they've heard Om or variations upon it, you know, since birth. I'm not saying they're not spiritual, but it wasn't like they were seeking it or knew what to do with it. And in fact, you all know, because I've told it a million times, about uh, Purushottama told me long, decades ago, that the AARP magazine sells Doan's pills. And it says in the ad, and I've seen the ad personally, are you plagued by these sounds? And then it has bells, drums, harp, flute, and so forth. Because as you get deaf, uh, some people at least are maybe calm enough or whatever they are, and they hear these things and they're plagued by them. Now, are you plagued by hearing these things? So, maybe you could get an early pension, and what do you think? So, so what Patanjali is saying to us is that it's not that those things have any necessarily meaning in and of themselves, in terms of your spiritual, what have you. Even psychics on the hotline, might, some of them must surely be psychic. But what it does is gives us a focal point for concentration. Now, more deeply, we know, we know and we're taught that Om or the different chakra sounds we should approach in a devotional, reverent manner and see and experience these inner astral perceptions as essentially divine manifestations, which indeed they are. But the problem is, and I've seen it a hundred times uh, teaching students, and it's exactly what I went through, I'd be sitting there, you know, doing my Om technique or something, and and then the sound sort of wanders in and out, and, and then uh, you don't pay any attention to it. It's a little distracting. Finally, after maybe weeks or months, you realize, you know, could that be the flute sound or trickling water or something? And then you think, hmm, you know, this is exactly what we talked about two weeks ago. First, there's doubt. You have an inner astral perception of any kind, any of the eight aspects, and you doubt yourself. Don't we, and I talked about this last, don't we always doubt ourselves? I mean, that's sort of our human problem, isn't it? We don't trust our own intuition. And then if we stick with it, though, we remember the teaching and how we're supposed to do these things, we listen more deeply, and we, we I sort of get it. Yeah, that's, wow, that's like a waterfall or whatever, you know? And then we, after that, we start to enjoy it. And then big smile inside, the inside smile um, begins to happen and so forth. And that's what Patanjali is guiding us to do. These are the eight aspects, essentially, is what he's talking. He doesn't enumerate any of them, but this is what awaits us there as a focal point of concentration. Now, what he doesn't say here, but says a million ways to Sunday elsewhere, is, um, if you connect the dots, is that contemplation upon, concentration upon, um, any of these aspects is, move, is was first off, is dharana, right? Okay, dharana is right here. What is the stage of dharana on the Eightfold Path? Dharana is when we're calm enough and internalized sufficiently to where we have a continuous, steady experience of one of these eight aspects. I mean, it could be other things. Maybe Master is appearing to you in vision and talking to you, but I, I can't say that I've had that continuously. So. We'll just keep it simple and talk about the chakra, the astral perceptions. So dharana, you're able to hold steady, or it, in truth, you don't hold anything, do you? It steadily comes to you and you're blessed by it. But in any case, you're able to hold that steady. And the steadiness, which is referred to here then in the stanza, is what leads us to, that's right, dhyana, true meditation here. Because as we focus on We'll call it Om, the simplest thing to talk about at least. Um, Om will begin, especially as we commune devotionally and, and we invite Om into us or we offer Om into it. Those are the two basic directions of, of human consciousness towards spirit, towards the soul. One is to be filled and possessed. The other is to enter into. It's kind of a male-female thing. Um, 
and some people do it one way at this time, the other way at that time, whatever, but those are valid experiences of the movement of prana in meditation. And in any case, um, we move into dhyana, where gradually that aspect um, fills us, if you will. And so that's, that's essentially uh, what he's, he's talking about to give us that. And so he's effectively answering the question of what do we do in that, um, that stage. We concentrate. We concentrate on whatever appears to us there. Now, let's face it, most of us, it's like uh, denada. And there's, there's nobody home. And so what do you do? Well, all the other things I talked about. Uh, hong saw on the spine, practice devotion, take any of the eight aspects or including the image of the guru and, and meditate on the image of the guru or attune your the vibration of your consciousness to peace or divine love and so forth in an effort, if you will, to raise your vibration. But here's the trick to that. And I remember one of the first things uh, I just remember so fondly when I uh, did my first eight hour meditation with Swami at Christmas, he, he gave that thing you've probably heard us all say, which is follow prana, these are my words, but basically he said during a long meditation, follow the energy in and out. So you'll go through periods of let's say a technique or just concentrating in the way I've just described, but then, then relax from that and receive. So it's, it's the principle of energization. That's why he says it's the principle of Kriya. And by that he means it's the principle of prana. It's the principle by which prana rises and merges with these higher uh, perceptions and so forth. So what you do then is if you need to make it, fake it till you make it, is essentially what we're saying here, then meditate on one of these aspects or on master or what have you. But then don't just you know, don't be a blockhead and stay there. You're doing it in order to receive. So, so let that dissolve and then receive. And when the dis receiving begins to, you know, waffle, if you will, then go back and essentially pray, but offer yourself or, or uh, visualize. It's sort of hard to put this in words because each person does these things all differently. But, but don't stay there. Again, let it dissolve and and see what flows into you. Does that make sense? Because it's, I've struggled for years trying to understand um, what I'm supposed to do in the third phase when I'm not in Samadhi. I mean when I'm not in Samadhi. Uh, and then somebody else asked, per pertinent to the subject, is, well, should we empty the mind? And then the question followed, can we empty the mind? That would be great, wouldn't it? <laughs> yes, you can, actually. And you should learn to do that at will. Come to a stop sign or a stoplight, look up, and I've said this before, stop. Learn to stop. You can do it. You can empty the mind. But the emptying of the mind, the nirvana, if you will, is, is only a beginning stage. It's like, <sighs> it clears the deck. It's not an end in itself. And there are some people who probably shouldn't do that kind of thing. Um, on a simplistic level, if you have a problem falling asleep in meditation, that would just be more organic or metabolic. But, but um, there are some people who could get into a little, if not trouble, uh, not helpful spaces by that process. But there's not very many people. Most of us who have active minds and strong, clear minds and can concentrate uh, should learn to concentrate in such a way that we can stop at will. Okay. So, but it's but as I say, it's just a it's just a clearing. I love that image. That is it. Um, is it another movie? Ma gives the image of going down the beach to get your little boat out, and the Gyanamata, and then the waves crash and then finally you or a surf I think of surfers because that's what I used to do and then you finally get out past the breakers where you can surf and oh and a sailboat can then lift a sail and then right Andrew after you get off out well you don't go through the breakers he has a <laughs> motor anyway and then you can lift your sail until effort becomes ease sahaja yoga and then the path becomes eventually effortlessly liberating 
So um, there, it, what I'm saying is that, that there's there effort, some effort is needed, but then you have to look for the breeze and lift the sail. Okay. Um, good. Stanza 37. Vita raga vishayam va chittam. Otherwise, also by attunement with the mind of an enlightened being, one who is completely free from all attachments to the senses. Otherwise, also, by attunement with the mind of an enlightened being who is completely free from all attachments to the senses. A lot of comments came in for the fact that um, I brushed over the whole issue Swami raised of Patanjali not talking about the need for a guru. Um, it created a bit of a firestorm protest, <clears throat> in a sense. But, you know, um, and, and on this stanza, he stops, he stops just a little short, doesn't he, of, of where he might have gone with this stanza. Attune your mind with an enlightened being, but no hint of anything more as we would verbalize or articulate in terms of a guru-disciple relationship. I'm not going to supplant anything Swami said by any means, but it, I can't help but occur to myself that it's as close as Patanjali gets, and I would, for one, would be happy to accept it as, as his advice to have a guru, but Swami didn't seem to want to take it that far, so I don't feel I can, though it seems like it's a pretty good hint. Um, you know, there have been saints, Ramana Maharshi, I, I believe, one of them, who did not have a, a known guru, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Saint Teresa of Avila didn't have a guru in the body, uh, and so on. And so, um, and the other point that came up, I'll come back to that, the other point that came up when I made the comment uh, about Treta Yuga and this scripture, uh, somebody said, well, gee, is that because um, in Treta Yuga everybody knows that already? <laughs> And I said, yeah, I think so. Uh, why not? Uh, I mean, Patanjali, as we're told, was an avatar himself. So uh, he, no doubt, had disciples. I don't think there's a, a ready answer for that. Uh, it's the teaching our masters have given, other great masters down through the ages have given. Patanjali doesn't seem to give it in, a, in clear prose, if you will. Um, but he certainly hints in various ways about the, the power of the teacher when he speaks of Om and Ishvara and the, as the teacher of all teachers and this stanza and so forth. So um, I, I take it, and this is just me, that in our age and in our culture more particularly, but in our age, we need to keep hearing the need for a guru. When I see all the spiritual, self-proclaimed, self-appointed spiritual teachers who roll through the different cities around the planet and, and uh, set themselves up, when I have encountered, as I have, uh, some even well-known so-called spiritual teachers, um, when I see what passes for this, and I at least inwardly... Uh, try to attune myself to Yogananda, and I reflect on my life with Kriyananda, uh, I don't have any question about the need for that and for the value of someone um, fully realized. Um, there's a lot of goofy spiritual teachers out there. I mean, naturally, in what I do, I, I have people call or come by and, or tell me about their experiences with some real nutcases, um, or manipul more manipulative, or we would call abusive, and 
and even Swami, he says a well-known spiritual teacher, and I personally don't know who it was, and if I did, I wouldn't say the name, but a well-known teacher tried to uh, convince Swami to be his guru, saying, quoting Yogananda, saying, um, well, didn't Yogananda say God is the guru? And so the, the presence of ego, in other words, even in, even in saintly people, is, is still there. And, um, you know, an avatar uh, is, is a true guru. In other words, a sat guru is, is as Shankaracharya said, the greatest blessing of the three worlds. So um, I think this, the emphasis on this teaching helps us. I think in a higher age or a more advanced person with a refined consciousness doesn't even question it. It's not even something they, they have to drool, drool over, drool over, no, um, think about whatever, you know. Uh, and as so many people who come to places like this really wrestle with, okay, it's a big thing for them. I, I don't always say this, but I, I mentally at least, and sometimes I do say it, try walking the spiritual path for a while with intensity, and then decide whether you don't need a guru. I mean, that's my answer to people, but, you know, people have to walk their own path. You, that's, that's why Swami says, if you ask the question, um, maybe not. Maybe you're not, you're not ready. And that's why the cliche says, when you're ready, the guru comes. Because it's a very personal question. And we here, in our speaking with other members and students and friends and relatives, should never be dogmatic. That's the essence of stupidity and, and a misrepresentation of Master's teachings. You can say what you believe for yourself, uh, what you're doing for yourself, but it should never be inflicted on, on others. You have to come to that realization yourself, and it's only done the hard way. So it's, it's an unanswerable question why Patanjali didn't, but I, I don't find it uh, disconcerting as, as maybe a few, few did. Um, okay, so let's talk about dreams and influences. I do both of them together? Yeah. Swapna, Nidra, Jnana Lambanam Va, Yatabhi Mata, Dhyanad Va. Otherwise, calmness comes also by concentration on some insight achieved during dreams or deep sleep. Otherwise also, by meditating on anything one finds elevating to his consciousness. Otherwise, calmness comes also by concentration on some insight achieved during dreams or deep sleep. Otherwise also, by meditating on anything one finds elevating to his consciousness. Curious, who here has had in your life uh, at least one instance where you had a lucid or clairvoyant or um, clear dream that also clearly had um, a message for you? Look at that. Probably half of just us gathered here. Um, it's, a, it's a long and time-honored um, filtrate, as Swami calls it in Awaken to Superconsciousness, filtrate for the superconscious to speak to us. And, and so Master spoke quite, um, as he always did, enthusiastically in his lessons about uh, the value and the practice of lucid dreaming. How many here have gone through some stage of their life where you actively tried to 
be a lucid dreamer. Anybody? Okay, a few of you. Well, I did in my early days on this path and found it lots of fun and got lots of good things out of it. But I found because I had two kids and two jobs, it, I, it was psychically draining. I needed <laughs> it. just was too much work. I just wanted to sleep. Uh, but, uh, but it can be done. And Yogananda encouraged us to affirm and believe and practice that we could enter any of the three states at will. You know the little practice he gave, you lower your eyes and through, through slowly drifting waters I sink into subconsciousness. And maybe in this course, I get them all mixed up. I've talked about the value of learning to say nap at will, okay? And then to come out of it. Um, how many of you wake up nanoseconds before that gnarly old alarm clock of yours? Yeah, it's easy, isn't it? You just, who's watching? You, somebody's watching the alarm clock and knows, right? Well, I don't even use the alarm clock anymore. Um, I just say, when I'm going to get up, and I just boink, get up. It, it, it's amazing. And so we, we should all be able to do that kind of thing. Now, entering superconsciousness at will, of course, is the brass ring. And uh, how many of you have seen that BBC video where Master lies down? And <laughs> it's, it's a hoot. It's a, first off, he scolds the British for not sleeping correctly. And... Uh, and then, and then he says, I know now enter superconsciousness. And he li he's lying down on his back, right? Not even sitting up to meditate. I don't, on a hard bench. And he lifts his eyes. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's hilarious. I mean, it's great. That's all you do. But it is right. It is all you do. So, um, you know, there is value to these things. In the Awakened Superconsciousness book, he uses that term filtrate. And I just wanted to nail that a little bit because... Um, most of our dreams, let's face it, are pretty worthless. But, but because we're not in superconsciousness that often, whether from the conscious, uh, whether in meditation or otherwise, um, it's as if the soul reaches into the dream state where the conscious mind is no longer intruding upon, you know, suppressing it, so to speak, or, or outshining it would be another image, and uses the dreaminess and, and the fluidity of the subconscious mind to send us a message. Um, I went for a hike with uh, Nivriti and Susan a few weeks ago and was telling them about a dream I had of an old aunt of mine when I was a child. She was elderly. And this was a very, I don't have these very often. I've had my share. She came to me in the dream. We had a great conversation um, about where the different houses were we used to live and so forth. It was crystal clear and I was lucidly present with her talking. And she died, you know hundreds of years ago, it seems now. But um, I don't know what the significance of the dream was. That's, that's the sad part. But it was very crystal clear. And so um, there is value to that. And you can program your psyche to remember your dreams. Nothing wrong with that. To uh, ask your soul, if you will, that if you have anything to say, you know, do so, and I will listen. It's all about listening. So uh, what Swami points out in the book, though, is he says, don't think that Patanjali is thinking that you're going to get to God through dreaming. That would be lovely, but because uh, the way the stanza is phrased, it's like he's, he's uh, bulleting all these different ways to achieve samadhi, and he, he doesn't distinguish one from the other in terms of value content or something. So he says... Don't go there. Um, as to influences, it's something we're very um, focused on here at Ananda in, in our lives and in Swami's guidance to us. But it has to do with something we like to give in the Superconscious Living course. And uh, I do a tiny bit of in Raja, which is to ask students to go home, walk around their house, look at the pictures on their wall, the colors and the paint, open their closet and wardrobe, look at what they wear, and ask themselves, who, who, is li who am I living with? <laughs> what sort of art objects do I put on the wall? You, know, you think of the, the cubist paintings. Or don't, Please don't argue with me about my taste in art. I'm not going to listen to you. But uh, you know, who wants these schizophrenic people on your walls or whatever? But it's good. Step back, you know, and, and look at uh, how you dress, how, how, what your home or apartment looks like, 
uh, it, reflect, it all reflects your mind. That's why people can look in your eyes or read tea leaves or look at your palm or any number of things because we're radiating. We're a hologram. We're a crystal. We're radiating our consciousness at all times. And anything we essentially touch more than once, if you will, um, that, quote, belongs to our aura at least, uh, reflects some aspect of our consciousness. So take a look. How you dress? How do you walk? I had to do this walking test today at the doctor. The guy wanted to see if I could walk a straight line. <laughs> but I have to say, by the time he was done, he said, wow, he said, you're really in good shape. This yoga stuff really works, doesn't it? I said, it really works. <laughs> so why are you here? <laughs> anyway, so um, be conscious of your surroundings. Obviously, the truth of this is your real surroundings, your real satsang is between the ears, isn't it, and in the heart. But on the other hand, um, one reflects the other. So it's a, good, it's a good thing to go through. Look at your, your surroundings. Okay, so now into some heavier material, 42 and 43. Tatra Shabdartha Jnana Vikalpaha Sankirna Savitarka Smriti Parishuddhau Swarupa Shunye Vartha Matra Nirbhasa Nirvitarka In the first stage of Samadhi, name, form, and particular awareness are commingled with the consciousness of infinity. When one's consciousness has freed itself of all self-identity, the true self shines forth in all its purity and brilliance beyond any reasoned definitions. This is the second nirvitarka or, or nirbikalpa samadhi. In the first stage of samadhi, name, form, and particular awareness are commingled with the consciousness of infinity. When one's consciousness has freed itself of all self-identity, the true self shines forth in all its purity and brilliance beyond any reasoned definitions. This is the second nirvitarka or nirbikalpa samadhi. So here we have a, yet another foray into samadhi, uh, sabhikalpa, nirbikalpa samadhi by Patanjali. And Swami expresses um, his frustration at how other commentators, that's a potato, right? Commentators? No. Um, make mincemeat out of, sorry, Marley, um, make mincemeat of this stuff because, I mean, it's very, it is very heady and I don't deny other great commentators their day in the sun in terms of how they explain these things, different levels of, of um, samadhi. But um, Swami, following Master's guidance and his teachings, uh, once again, simplified it to the essence of sabhikalpa and nirvikalpa. Um, he, you know, this mixing of name, form, and whatever else he says here uh, is an interesting, what I would like to offer that we can take from it is, is the issue that, you know, in the teaching of samadhi, it's so distant from our consciousness. I, 
one, before talked about memorizing the poem Samadhi and trying to tune into it, and I, I'll repeat that here because it's appropriate. But we, we need to affirm in our own silent, subjective way that God, Samadhi, oneness, they're just words, is always right here, right here now. And when we're having maybe a better than average meditation, for example, um, that presence, which has no name, cannot be defined, as, as Ananda Moi Ma said, and she did say this, it is and it isn't. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, it's just right there. And so this idea of you know, having a good meditation and maybe you're meditating on master's eyes or you're, you're feeling your whatever, you know, deep peace and contentment or something. Um, make the mental intuitive effort to, like Ramakrishna when his guru came to him, Totapuri, who just came like, I think maybe he met him once, but anyway, he came, because he was an avatar, Ramakrishna, so he didn't really need much of a guru, but Totapuri came to him, and Ramakrishna was having all these, you know, bothersome visions of Kali. Just must have been a nuisance for the poor guy. That was a joke. And, and, and remember the story? Totapuri took a piece of glass and ground it right into the guy's spiritual eye and, and said, you know, uh, destroy Kali, goddess Kali. And then he went into the formless state. And he was having that Leela with Divine Mother. But it's not the final Leela, if, if you dare call the Samadhi a Leela. And so um, it's right there behind our form, right there bef behind our imaging, right there before behind our dhyana, behind our intuitive experience of these things in meditation. So when you feel that wonderful upliftment and you're very quietly centered within, words don't do it, but that oneness is there. And it, it's mixed. That's, what, that's, that's my interpretation or whatever. How we can relate to it maybe more meaningfully is you do sort of go in and out of it. You do have a sense. Meditators call it the wall. And we don't hear it in Nando, but, but other things, other people do. And, it's, and this was Vivekananda's experience. Um, <clears throat> Vivekananda was, first off, Ramakrishna told Vivekananda that I called you from above to help me with my work. And I'm withholding from you the goodies. Because you, I've got to squeeze a lot of work out of your 39 years. That's all he lived. And, right? 39 years? Yeah. And... Um, and so um, Vivekananda was meditating one day, apparently, you know, perhaps about to go into a high state. And then he said, oh, I've got to take care of my mother. And, and Ramakrishna was disgusted. He said, not you too. Everyone says the same thing. And it's true. Um, you have this wonderful, uplifting experience, and then you think, oh, did I leave something on the stove? Or <clears throat> or maybe, what about my mother? Because, you know, uh, what's his name? Vivekananda really had an issue with his mother, didn't he? And, and remember, he went to, I just love the story, uh, he went to Ramakrishna, pleading him time and again that when he was in with Divine Mother, with Kali, would he ask her to take care of his mother? <laughs> And every time you say, well, what would she say? And Ramakrishna said, oh, darn, I forgot. <laughs> he went through this three or four times, just so charming. And uh, finally, at one point, he said, don't worry about it. She'll take care of it. And some wealthy benefactor came along, took care of the guy's mother. But everybody does the same thing. Just at the moment of some upliftment, doubt comes in. And you're not sure. And so the excuse is, what about my mother? Or what about my pension? Or something stupid. But it sounds silly and stupid, but it isn't. Because it happens to everyone. Remember when, uh, when uh, Dr. Lewis was pestering Master for Samadhi? Right? Finally got sick of this. And so he grabbed the guy by his big, giant, old-fashioned Bostonian lapels and yanked him forehead to forehead and said, if I gave it to you, doctor, could you take it? And doctor meekly looked down, he felt the power, and he said, no, sir. So, you know, it, it's okay, I mean, it's important to feel that it's there, because you'll never have a problem with being taken out of your body, or, 
or anything beyond your, you know, what you're ready for, because the most likely thing is you're going to look at your watch and say, I've got to go to work. So, so don't worry about it. <laughs> but it's just right there. The other thing he, he talks about is, of course, the shining self. He doesn't really say a lot of that. Uh, we're going to get into some other points on that that I find very inspiring. Um, so I, I think I'll just leave, leave it at, at that. Yeah, where are we? And we're at 46, or oh, the two, the seeds. Yeah. <coughs> Tayeva sabijaha samadhihi. Tayeva sabijaha samadhihi. These two samadhis are, even so, still seeded. These two samadhis are, even so, still seeded. So this, of course, is a continuation of the conversation about that. Sabhikalpa samadhi is seeded with the hypnosis that lingers, that the ego re remains separate from the experience of oneness. And that, of course, as Swami points out several times in this book, is our greatest test. In the Raja book, he talks about, I think of the symbol of the cross. He doesn't talk about the cross, but it is, it is precisely what he's talking about, and I know it to be a valid statement from other sources. But in any case, he says most of us on the path of life, what to mention the spiritual path, are trying to get centered, which is to say to nullify or neutralize our karma, whether it be health, uh, you know, all the things. And so we're trying to get back in our spine. But that's not actually the most difficult battle. It might take the longest time. It, you know, it takes eight to 12 million incarnations just to become a human. And after that, there's no end in sight because it's totally up to us. But getting back in the spine is part one of two. And that's what Martin Luther, remember, in the breadth of life and the, of the height of life and so forth, he had this wonderful imagery, which he didn't actually make up, but it's a beautiful symbol for the cross. Anyway, when we bring our energy in and we walk the, the path of life with integrity, it's the question of virtue that we've talked about before. You become centered, uh, self-contained and so forth, and you live according to righteousness. But the real battle is lifting the energy, drawing the kundalini back and offering it and so sabi kalpa is that final frontier where the lingering hypnosis of the separateness of the self to which the soul comes back after a brief experiences in oneness and samadhi um, has to be overcome. With that great infinite power and vision and so forth, um, what else could more greatly feed the ego? Years ago, in some context I don't recall, it might have been the essence of the Bhagavad Gita. Swami makes an interesting comment, though I don't think it is. But anyway, interesting comment. He says that <clears throat> most people, their, their egotism, their pride as a human being, is fairly quickly snuffed out by duality itself. You know, I strut around and then somebody knocks me over. I mean, in the, in the worldly sense. Uh, if nothing else, age, disease, and death, and competition will wipe you out at some point. He talked about a study of major corporations in the 20s, and they interviewed all these successful people, some magazine writer did. Well, within 10 or 15 years, those people were toast. I mean, they were, you know, committed suicide, or their companies were bankrupt, or, and so the world takes care of worldly people. But the yogi, 
what the cities we're going to study in uh, uh, Vibhutipada in the third book, the powers that's gained on the spiritual path are actually real because they derive from soul force. And that pride is actually, uh, in a sense, in an odd sense, warranted. And that's why it's the final test. Because you actually do know something. You actually have become something. You actually have power. Oh, Mona, did you get your little bag off the downstairs counter? Yeah, great. Um, yeah. Oh, okay, great. But there's no lasagna in it. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right. Where's my lunch? <laughs> <laughs> now, the other seed, though, interestingly, in, in Nirvikalpa Samadhi is the one Swami has taught us many times, which is the Jivan Mukta, upon achieving um, unbroken Samadhi, um, and can no longer fall due to ego and pride, nonetheless has like, tr as clouding like Wordsworth trails of glory or something, clouds of something, um, we have all our past karma. And so when he says the two are seeded, the one is seated with what I just said, hypnosis of separateness, but the final liberation is still seated with past karma. And so that past karma need, now needs to be uh, worked out or disassociated, really, uh, with the ego in whatever time frame you want. It's like you're free. I mean, do you care? Why would you care? I don't think. They do, and so they take many lives. So later on, Patanjali will say that such a one can incarnate into multiple bodies. Sounds hideous to me for some reason. <laughs> sort of dark, but anyway, I'm sure it isn't. But, you know, as if they're in a hurry. But I don't know why they would be in a hurry. And then Swami talks about how such ones uh, retain that lingering karma in order to help people. We were saying after class, was it last week, that I think that's essentially, though I, can, I don't represent the teaching of Buddhism, so I can't say precisely, but I believe that's more or less the teaching of the Bodhisattva, which is that, that great one who, who chooses to come back. Maybe that's an avatar, but, but I suspect it's actually a, more of a Jivan Mukta, but I don't really know. So let me just check my notes, because he goes on and on in this, and uh, he makes a couple of very good points because, you know, we talk about 8 to 12 million incarnations, and after that all bets are off. Um, isn't that cruel? Many people just, just can't swallow that, I can assure you, in talking to new students and so forth. But Swami has always made the point, and he makes it in the Raja text too, that the fact is most of us don't want it any other way. We want the goodies that are out here. We've made that choice. Now, sure, this, it's a little bit unfair because the goodies look pretty good, but um, still, it's what we want. All right? And then he goes into um, his insight into Satchitananda that, that I've touched upon before, which I, I find very sort of heart-opening and, and somehow a new contribution, uh, which is that First off, Master added to uh, Shankaracharya's term Satchitanandam, he added the ever new part in the translation. Do you think Satchitanandam, it must go way further back than Shankaracharya, the term? Uh, but it's from Upanishads. Yeah, it, so it's not even Shankaracharya would be the one to co coin the term. But um, it was an interesting antidote to what had become the rise of Buddhism in India at the time. And as it began to incline towards maybe an agnostic temperament, I won't say atheistical, but, but um, you know, because Buddha didn't speak of, of higher things or God, um, Shankaracharya came, Master said, to, um, you know, to affirm the infinite, the supreme spirit, if you will, and to do so in a very admittedly impersonal way, <clears throat> but that was apparently needed at the time, and was, of course, a contrast to the very overly personified form that Brahmanism and, and much of Hinduism had already long since by that time taken on. But in any case, um, ever existing and Master added ever new. And then Swami talks about how ever new is not, not only ever newly enjoyable, which is how I've always sort of assumed it meant, and it does, but he says it also has ever new manifestations, 
ever new appearances <laughs> through you and I and everything else. It's the nature of bliss to manifest, to, you know, it's like a bright light. Uh, light, give, uh, light, by definition, goes out and shines. Like Jesus said, don't hide your light under a bushel. And so it's the nature of joy, of bliss, to expand. It's an expansive aspect. Okay. Um, all right. So we are at the end of sadha, uh, the first book <clears throat> and Sadhana Pada. So I think we're doing okay. Um, you want to read stanza one about mm-hmm. Kriya Yoga? Yeah. Tapaha. Svadhyaya, Ishwara Prani Danani, Kriya Yogaha. Accepting pain as purification, study of the scriptures and introspection, openness to the divine will and guidance, these constitute the practice of yoga. Accepting pain as purification, study of the scriptures and introspection, openness to the divine will and guidance, these constitute the practice of yoga. One of the things that had come up in the emails was, why doesn't Patanjali speak of the spiritual eye? Well, for that matter, why doesn't he speak of the chakras? Patanjali is not teaching how to meditate. It's assumed, and this is another interesting implication here in respect to one's spiritual teacher or the need for a spiritual teacher, is the actual techniques of Kriya are, are not taught in the slokas. Slokas, is that correct? Yeah, themselves, in the sutras, that's what I was trying to say, themselves. <laughs> And so in this passage, this is only one of, and I believe, two actual slokas that use the term Kriya Yoga. Is, isn't that just two? Yeah. Yeah. I can't remember where the other one is, but this it's, is our first. It's pretty much, I think, a few sutras just later, right. I believe. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yet, and this is a, it could be a puzzler, yet Swami, in his, both his translation of the sloka itself and in the explanation, doesn't mention Kriya Yoga. Master references this uh, stanza in the autobiography saying Patanjali mentions twice Kriya Yoga. Why doesn't Swami mention Kriya Yoga? Acceptance of pain as purification. What's the other one? Um, um, uh, uh, self, self-study. Uh, self-study. Right. And, and divine the acceptance guidance. of the divine openness to divine guidance. Yeah. Is the practice of yoga not Kriya Yoga. I don't know the answer to the question, but I think the answer is more or less obvious, which is that these three or four items that he lists are part of the spiritual path, surely, but it would be absurd for us here today to equate those three or four attitudes or practices with Kriya Yoga, because it's not even close to the technique. Patanjali doesn't teach the technique. So I, I think that must be the only reason in his interpretation that he doesn't, um, you know, try to say he's talking about Kriya Yoga as we know it, as a technique. There really aren't as such techniques taught in the Yoga Sutras. They're inferred, they're implied, they're alluded to, but your spiritual teacher is, is the one who finds for you that which is appropriate for you. Um, Let me just check my... Yeah, he goes into a lot of uh, the, you know, um, sadhu beware things that that are 
really very worthwhile. You know, what happens when people insult you? In other words, svadhaya means self-study, of course, and self-awareness. And, of course, also, as we are doing here, study of truth precepts through the great ones in scriptures. <clears throat> but, but he challenges us with those questions. What happens um, when you do feel pain? Can you accept pain with equanimity? Can you expect, uh, uh, accept hardship with, um, with even with joy? Not easy to do. But that becomes the test. In fact, earlier in an earlier sloka, um, he, he, Patanjali, said very simply that, that the spiritual pra practice is even-mindedness, and we, we discussed that before. So here, he, in a way, he's taking that steadiness, and he's sort of showing some facets of it. Once again, acceptance of the divine will. Um, I wouldn't go so far as to say that's in a, a reference to the guru, but um, if you assume a spiritual teacher is needed, it certainly would be. So, uh, it's, however, it's not Kriya Yoga. Okay, so um, hmm, I'm going to pause right there and just see, check my list of things that came up before we go on. For example, our, what's the difference between vrittis and karma? There isn't any. Vrittis are the um, evidence of karma lodged in the astral body. Uh, some scars are more like entire families of rittis, I suppose. That's my term. I just get popped out of my mouth. But meaning tenden whole tendencies. It's like the rose-colored glasses one person might wear or the sarcastic glasses uh, that somebody else... And more specific than that. But that's like a whole view of life almost, a whole set of subset of tendencies. I'm artistic. I'm business-like, I'm this and that, those sorts of things. Whereas individual vrittis, one could say, uh, are the consequences of particular karmas. And when they lodge together, maybe they become, a, as I coined the term, a family of <laughs> vrittis. <laughs> anyway, uh, somebody asked, and this was off the wall, I won't say the name, though I'd love to say the name. Um, <laughs> Uh, are the yugas like vrittis? How does that grab you? Well, the whole world is a vritti. The whole creation is a vritti. It's just that that's not the right term. You know, we don't use that. It's, that's really wonky, kind of. But it's true. I mean, okay, think of it. Everything is spirit. Everything is consciousness. Everything that's created is a vritti in the sense that it's a commitment of prana, of divine energy, towards a particular form. Okay. So, sure, every, everything's vrittis, but does that really enlighten us in any way? I don't think so. Our job is to get rid of the ones we got. <laughs> we don't have to worry about the cosmic vrittis, if you will. Uh, that's not our job. So, I thought it was a, a kind of a fun, fun question. All right, so is there something bubbling up here that has to be heard? No? Is that boring? Okay, well, we got a few... Oh, yeah. Well, you mentioned a moment ago uh, about Kriya Yoga, and I, I just had the thought, well, if I'm remembering the definition properly, doesn't Kriya mean action? Mm -hmm. So maybe the, in that sense, the, the, the Tanjali phrase is not talking about Kriya Yoga as we think about it. Maybe he's think, thinking about the concept of action. Yes. Um, so... You want to repeat that for the... The question was, in speaking about Patanjali talking about Kriya Yoga or not, if Kriya means action, then perhaps all he's talking about is these are the things that constitute the actions in yoga. There, there can be no denying it. It's absolutely true. Um, of course, he talks about a lot of other things that could be similarly constituted, but certainly that's got to be a Patanjali's meaning. But Swami's omission of, of connecting it to what we call Kriya Yoga is equally, I think, obvious that, that he's referring you know, to the path of Kriya Yoga, perhaps. Yeah, yeah I, I completely agree. Okay, so a few more minutes. Stanza three, the five obstacles. Okay. Avidya, 
अस्मिता रागा द्वेशा भी निवेशा हा क्लेशा हा दीज देर आर फाइव ऑब्स्टिकल्स इग्नोरेंस ईगोइज्म अटैचमेंट्स अवर्शंस एंड क्लिंगिंग टू बॉडीली लाइफ There are five obstacles: ignorance, egoism, attachments, aversions, and clinging to bodily life. I don't know that there's a lot to add. There, Swami went into some directions with this. Um, One of the points that I thought interesting is he, you know, we think of ignorance as all the stupid things we do, which is fair enough, um, whether spiritually or otherwise. But Swami points out that we should see ignorance from Patanjali's point of view as simply ignorance of the true self, of the soul. That's the only. That's the core sort of existential ignorance out of which all. Others come, and the stanzas or sutra, or slokas that follow, all focus in different ways on this concept of ignorance. Um, egoism, I don't think we need to pursue at this point. But, but Swami asked the question, or at least I did. I can't remember how he put it. But um, reactions in other people, and other reactions, it should say to other people. So he points out something very worthwhile and very practical here, in relation to quote egoism. He says, as I know Jamuna has in her classes on relationships and so forth. Basically, when you really boil down life, for most people, huge percentage of people, our issues are with people. Our karmas are around people. Okay, there's you know money issues and stuff, but um, it's really, especially in terms of the yogi, in terms of the devotee, because uh, all those other things are more more on the scale of worldly desires. But our reactions to people, even just seeing one another, um, our judgment, our view of people, this has a this has a high. Uh, investment return, a high yield for um, liberation, a great yield uh, and profit can be made by using your internal reactions and maybe some of your external ones to people as the basis for introspection and swadaya, for self-study. This is the, in many ways, the greatest and and most uh, best harvest of. Self-awareness of our spiritual tests by the yardstick of our measurement and judgment and reaction to, especially reaction to, other people. We can learn more about ourselves than probably any single activity that we do. Even meditation, which after all is a very small percentage of the hours of our of our waking hours spent, and are focused hopefully on God. So um, I think that's a very practical and well worth while thing to point out. Um, he mentions the thing that he does in the Awakened Book too. How he, he Swami, uh, has made it a lifelong habit. He says, "I don't pray for myself," and then he tells that story of the something in the something stones. I get those stones mixed up. Kidney stones, Kidney stones right? Okay, and. Uh, And anyway, he wouldn't pray for himself, but finally, after hours of excruciating pain, he prayed to Divine Mother that if you want me to do the Sunday service that's supposed to begin in a few minutes, uh, 
I think you're going to have to do something. And barely before the words got out of his mind, um, the pain instantly vanished. But the funny thing is, is whereas in pain he couldn't have given the service or talked, and the truth is when he tried to give the service he couldn't talk because he was in bliss. <laughs> and he says, not because I was relieved of the pain, but just, just the incredible blessing of, of an obvious divine blessing that came to him in that. So he says, I don't ask others to hold by this bar of not praying for oneself. That's too high a bar for, for most people. So you shouldn't hold yourself in terms of self-judgment uh, when you ask for prayers from other, for, uh, from other people. Uh, that's, that's too much to ask for most of us. But it's an interesting precept to meditate on. And, and it, it reflects the possibility of such um, detachment, such uh, aparahigraha, um, non-attachment to, let's say, in, in terms of physical illness, at least the physical body. So, okay. Uh, just about to wrap it up. And of course, as we know from our study of the lives of our, our masters in the autobiography, even the masters... Uh, you know, have a little wobble there, like the precision of the equinoxes, or whatever that thing is called, that wobbles, um, when they hear of or intuitively become aware of their own impending mortality. Uh, they have to get centered. I don't know, I mean, so far as we know, that wasn't true for Master, was it? Uh, he kept running around telling people, <laughs> Wish me luck, big day tomorrow, and, and other such things as we know for, from the new, new path. So he seemed to have embraced the whole thing without hesitation, but who can say for sure? But, but anyway, um, that's designed, I mean, you know, attachment, death, it's, it's sort of the final exam, as Swami calls it. So again, we shouldn't be too harsh on ourselves if in various situations, including when that time comes, we do experience fear and so on. That's pretty deeply embedded over millions of lifetimes of various forms of death, and many of which I'm sure were not pleasant. So, But still, to hold that out as a possibility is, is wonderful. So I'm going to end here, but I just want to see where I'm at. Ah, what, what we're going to do, and we're going to very quickly go through, uh, we'll probably sail right through book two, but the next uh, series of slokas has to do with um, ignorance in the form of karma. And karma is always a very uh, sort of fun and interesting topic. Um, free will, some very curious points about the gunas that um, I had never quite noticed before. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, Swami talks about his his annoying dental habits of not taking <laughs> Novocaine. He just raps on that all the time to, <laughs> to the embarrassment of some people. Uh, so I think we're going to move through that pretty quickly. The other thing is we're not, we're not here next week. Next week for Kriya Bonds is the Kriya Meditation, always on Tuesday night, not Wednesday night. So there's nothing here Wednesday night next. Uh, Padma returns next Wednesday, which means at the following Wednesday, which is the fifth Wednesday of the month, okay, we are meeting, and she'll return for that. Uh, so I'm sure she'll have lots to say um, on, if not this subject, others. She's had a very profitable experience. Uh, the two uh, women who are taking over foreign rights are just, whew, they're hot stuff, very sharp, and a uh, good match, one being more outgoing, Nandini, and sort of salesmanship-like, a uh, very, you know, heart person. Manu is more administrative and, you know, just got it together. And so Padma's very pleased that uh, Swami's work will continue in good hands. She's en route now to Assisi, but I think she's missing the big pilgrim. Those of you on Facebook following the pilgrims in Assisi, I think they're finished now, and I, I don't even know if she'll she'll see Jyotish and Davy. Um, I'm hoping she will. I'm sure she's hoping she will. They're just real close because they biff off to India, I think, the same day that pilgrims come back to the States with Daiva and Gangamata. So she'll have lots of news, but it's been a very, very successful trip. So I think we'll have a moment of silence 
And <clears throat> as we go into a simple meditation, I I was reflecting a political slogan a few years ago that says it's that said it's the economy stupid. Remember that that stupid thing. Well, I, what popped into my febrile brain the other day was, it's the fluctuation, stupid. <laughs> but you know, yoga's chitta vritti nirod, calming the fluctuations in the reactive process, it's all about feeling. It's not about not feeling. It's entirely feeling. It's bliss. That's what we're seeking. So feel that bliss. Om Shanti, Shanti, Amen. Okay, two weeks from now.